drug companies would never price a medicine at a price that didn't give them the maximum revenue. There's a little chart we learned in business school. We paid big money to get these business school lessons. Check this out. I'm gonna give you one of the secrets. This is like revealing Scientology secrets right now. You've got price, okay, times, this dot is a times, they also teach that. that has been passed down from generation to generation of Rockefellers. Times volume, okay, is revenue. Now, if you make this too high, this will go down. And then this will go down. So you were trying to optimize revenue. So you gotta think about just how much price and the elasticity like elastic, of supply and demand. It kind of looks like this. This is a supply curve. As the price goes down, it goes up. Demand goes down. This is demand. This is price. And it's the opposite. When price is low, demand is very high. This is a supply curve. This is a demand curve. They meet at equilibrium. You price too high, demand is very low. You price too low, demand becomes very high. That's it. You raise this too much, this drops. You rate, you put this too low, this will go up a lot. So no drug company in their right mind would have their price way too high. What happens if you put your price way too high? This is demand. Demand would be very low. This is zero, right? So what would stop me from putting my drug price at a million dollars a pill? I would have no demand, right? And I would have no revenue. With no volume or demand, this will be zero too. So every drug company prices it just enough to get volume, but not so high that they have what's called demand destruction. Well, you could put it high, that's great. Insurance has to pay for it. So everyone wins, drug company wins, patients still get their drugs. That's what happened in Aeroprim. But there is a limit to pricing. I mean, you can't put a, a million dollars a pill, people just won't take it. Yeah, demand destruction, it's a common, common theme. Insurance companies never fight drug companies, especially not for serious, serious uh, illness. Well, some companies have, but a million dollars a pill would be three, four hundred million dollars a patient. There's just no, nobody's ever going to pay that. They just as soon say, sorry, we're, we're not covering it. But yeah, there are two million dollar drugs, four million dollar drugs. Why are you working? It's Sunday. Exactly. It's Sunday. Or it's work day. It's literally time to work. Something wrong with you? You don't work on Saturday, and Sunday. You know what's happening? Your competitor is working on Saturday and Sunday. And your competitor on Monday is going to unveil the thing that's going to kill you. And you're going to sit there saying, oh, man, I wish I went to the park. I didn't want to go. I just I wish I didn't go. I, I went to the park and, and now I'm out of business. That's why every time you see one of these billionaires or whatever, you think they, they got there because they're lucky? You think it was just like an accident? Oh, yeah, you know, we just stumbled upon this thing called Facebook. And, oh, man, it's crazy how how it made me the, the most most you know, the person who made the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time in, in the history of humanity. Yeah, it just, just, just seemed to work. Crazy how it works. In terms of how the bubble actually plays out, it's very interesting. Tech caused a big reckoning in the crossover and hedge fund world for investing in privates. So I think that we'll see the same beginning of the bubble, which is uh, venture funds chasing valuations and stuff like that. But I think the exits will be IPOs. And I think that, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I could be wrong here. But I think we will see like $5 billion, $1 to $10 billion kind of IPOs of AI companies with no revenue um, or limited revenue. And I think people will be okay with that. Now, remember in the tech bubble of 99 and 2000, it wasn't so much the large market caps. It was actually the number of $1 to $5 billion market caps that there were a bunch of fly-by-night companies that went up and then went down and that was it. Um, you also saw a generic boom in tech valuations uh, because of the internet and, and you had stocks that didn't have much like exposure to the quote-unquote internet and they were still would go from like 15 or 20 times earnings to like 60 or 70 or 80 times earnings. Uh, Microsoft is actually a fairly good describer of that actually. <laughs> All they had at the time was Office and Windows and neither one was really particularly level to the internet but their valuation <laughs> quadrupled anyway. So... You know, I think that, you know, I don't, I think people will be a little more rational about AI um, benefiting kind of all these companies, but you do see some of this starting to play out in the markets, like Adobe's released an AI product. Microsoft obviously is going to be very exposed, but it'll be interesting to see other companies kind of 
you know, try to get there. The problem is so much of these companies already sort of have this expectation that they'll deploy this new technology, how much it'll actually increase revenue and things like that. If we see real increases to revenue, like an extra 10% revenue a year or something like that, we will get a big bubble in every tech stock. But I don't know if we're going to actually get that or we're going to see cost reduction, which the market's a lot less kind of excited about. So um, it's sort of a conundrum. Like for there to be a bubble, there has to be asset prices that inflate. For their asset prices to inflate, there has to be assets with prices in the begin to begin with. And there's a boom. I mean, I've, I've started a, a new AI product um, and uh, other companies, you know, are being started by the day. I'm sure like 100 AI companies just started and got incorporated today. So everyone's going to try to take advantage of this um, boom, including the investors who will pump money into this stuff. But then the investors have to turn and put the hot potato somewhere else. And I think the stock market is probably more likely this time than the last several times where it was like these mega funds, soft bank, hedge funds like Tiger. A lot of these folks are once burned, twice shy. And I think the public markets will be the, the place to sort of put all this merchandise. Why a bank needs to have debt. Isn't that funny? You know, that, that a bank like JP Morgan actually has debt. I can understand a, an industrial company having debt, right? If I'm uh, Pfizer and I want to buy a biotech company that's really promising, I might say, well, I could pay with it with cash on my balance sheet, or I can borrow money from JP Morgan. That kind of makes sense. But it's kind of weird to me that then JP Morgan would go borrow money as well. Um, and it's not a small amount, right? It's $400, $350 billion. Um, and presumably it's, it's a safe bet, but what do we know, right? Everything's safe until proven otherwise. So here's trading liabilities. And again, I think these are like, as I think more about what could trading liabilities be, they're trading assets and trading liabilities. I think these are probably like assets with trading partners, things like that. So it's about 200 billion. It's a very large number for a vague, a pretty vague statement. So these bank, bank balance sheets are something else. I got to tell you. All right. So we have v, VIEs, which are sort of weird financial instruments. And that's it. We have total liabilities of 3.3 billion. So the book value of JP Morgan is 292 billion. 292 billion. And if we reduce that by goodwill, the tangible book value is 231 billion. But the market value of JP Morgan is 393 billion. So it makes you wonder why JP Morgan's trading at two times book value. Most people say that banks should trade at one times book value um, or slightly slight premium to that, but not more. So JP Morgan looks pretty, pretty overvalued um, just based on that alone. But we still also have to like dissect this really carefully. But that's like a rule of thumb for most banks is that they they should not be trading at this massive premium to their book value because ultimately, you know, a bank is nothing more than than its assets. And as its assets get worked out, that's really all you get in the bank. It's not like you're buying a franchise, right? You're just buying the current loan book. So. That doesn't apply in a tech company where the book value doesn't really tell you anything other than the maybe the rock bottom value of what a company should be. Whereas a book value for a bank actually does kind of reflect you know what it should be. Um, it's funny that actually in banks, if you try to become the largest stockholder of a bank, you actually have to get regulated as well. So they just they don't let just anybody be the largest stockholder of a bank. Isn't that funny? It's uh, it's regulated by the OCC that I mentioned earlier. So, for example, if I wanted to go buy all the stock of First Republic, they probably wouldn't let me. Or they probably wouldn't let a foreign company do that either. Dude, they've raised, they've diluted like almost nothing. Like, look at this Series B. Do you see this, guys? They raised 50 million at 2 billion. So that means that some of you may not know this. I'm sorry if I have to belabor this. Um, let me use my trusty Microsoft Paint. So pre-money valuation. So this is a concept in venture investing that basically means what is the company worth before the new investors? Does that make sense? So if you and I decided we're gonna start a company, let's call it Nibbles Co. Nibbles and Company, there we go. And we just agree that, okay, we own it 50-50. And we want to sell 1% of Nibbles Co. for $10 million. That means the 99%, right, if each 1% is worth $10 million, 
the other 99% would be 990 million, right? So total of 1 billion. So we could say the pre-money for Nibbles Co. is 1 billion. Now, I don't think anybody would put money in that because Nibbles Co. isn't a really exciting company. But for Notion, they said the pre-money would be 2 billion. And then they raised 50 million. So the post money is 2 billion plus 50 million, which is 2.05 billion, right? So now the old investors own 2.00 divided by 2.05. Calculate that. 2 divided by 2.05 is. 97.6%. The new investors own the rest, right? 0 0.05 divided by 0, 2.05, just 2.4%. So this is very little dilution, right? If you started this company 50-50, right? You only lost 2.5% of the company to the new investors. And of course you got the 50 million in your bank account, which you could do a lot with. So that's, that's kind of the idea. So the other thing they did was they did the series C, same idea where they sold 275 million at 10 billion, a whopping 10 billion pre-money. So 10.275 billion post-money. Old investors own 10 divided by 10.275, which is 97.3%. New investors own 2.7%, right? So they went through both funding rounds and only gave up 2.5% and then 2.7%. So the founders of this company must own, if you ignore the Series A, which we can't ignore, they might own still up to 40%, right? So if there were two co-founders, which I'm not even saying that there are, but just the founders alone would be 95%, investors 5%. Isn't that crazy? We don't know who those founders are. There could be five of them, 10 of them, or there could just be one of them. And that person owns 95% or that group of people of a $10 billion company. So they're worth about $9 billion. That's the, the promise of tech. But we haven't looked at the Series A yet, and that's where a lot of the valuation sometimes, a lot of the dilution happens. Okay, so not in this case. <laughs> so they raised $18 million at an $800 million pre-money. So that's only another 2 or 3% dilution. This company has done amazing. And look at these investors. They are now up 10x, right, in just two years. They're up, or three years, they're up 10x. We've got a couple of venture firms, but also people like Elad Gill, who's a very famous investor. So amazing how well Notion has done. Let's look at the seed round or angel round. Let's see, the angel round was, Sequoia was in there, and we don't have a valuation there. So that valuation could have been maybe more, more dilutive, but again, only raised, it's not even clear what they raised, if any, you know, what they raised at all. And there was only one investor in the, in the seed round. So my guess is the founders of this company are, are mega billionaires. We got um, Akshay Kathari, uh, Madhu Mutukmukar, Kumar. I messed that one up. Who's the CEO? Oh, Ivan Zhao. Usually Ivan is a Russian name, right? Ivan Zhao. Multi-zillionaire now. Just kind of came out of nowhere. And interesting, they founded the company in uh, 2013, it looks like. So it's not been an overnight success. Constant currency is C-O-N-S-T-A-N-T, -T, constant. And what that means is adjusting for um, uh, the changes in foreign exchange rates. They, if they were, if they're constant, if currencies were constant, they would have grown 7%, which is a lot different from 2%. But um, last quarter was 16%, and they've had like 20% growth before that. So growth is definitely slowing for Microsoft, and that's why we're so interested in tonight's, tonight's results. Do you think the recession will happen soon, 2023 or 2024? I don't know. Um,
it depends on what you mean by recession too. Uh, one of my first business school classes, somebody asked, um, the professor, excuse me, the professor asked, what is the definition of a recession? And I raised my hand as the like, go getter kid, the over, over eager kid. And I, um, I raised my hand. And I said, two sequential quarters of decline in GDP growth. And the professor said, wrong. And I looked at him like, what? <laughs> you know, I know what recession is. And he said, no, a recession is when my friends can't find a job. A depression is when I can't find a job. And it's one of these old jokes. Um, but uh, recession means different things to everybody. And, and the, the, the technical definition of a recession is not always uh, the same thing as... Uh, you know, what, what the practical thing is. And we've haven't had much unemployment, which I think personally, no matter what you look at as GDP growth, you have to, you have to have severe unemployment to, to call something a recession, in my opinion, but you could have a technical recession that doesn't do anything. There's one thing I've learned in business is you can never have too many Indians. All right. So if they, if they replace Sundar, it's gotta be, well, it doesn't have to be, but if you learn how to analyze banks, you can analyze them one after another. Canadian banks are, are solid, right? A bank fails because it can't meet its liquidity requirements. So if a depositor wants their money back and the bank doesn't have the liquidity to provide the deposit, then that's you know basically how a bank fails. A bank can also be declared failed by a regulator. So I guess, you know, there is an auction going on for SVBs. Yeah, I mean, I think the bailout talk is, I see it both ways. I see it as obviously a bad thing in the sense that, you know, we shouldn't encourage poor management to be, like these guys basically took this risk for this extra reward and they basically said, well, you know, if, if the worst happens, we have to, you know, we'll get, uh, we'll get bailed out. Like, I, obviously, like that's not, all these other companies are more prudent. So it's really not, not fair, right? So the thing about banks is the whole point of the bank is book value. A bank, book value is just assets, right? Minus liabilities. And the problem with book value is it's very hard to measure with most uh, banks. It's very easy to measure everywhere else, right? When we pull up the assets, as I've done hundreds of times here, when I pull up the assets and liabilities of a of a company, it's fairly easy to tell what's a real asset and what's a real liability. So remember, there are three financial statements, right? The big three, income statement, balance sheet, and what else? You guys know, my, my kid is gonna know this when my kid is like four years old. Cash flow statement, good, good, everybody knows, that's good. Income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. Some people say the holy trinity, right? There's some differences between these uh, statements. The income statement is what I'm looking at now. The income statement is so-called period statement, right? A period is a period of time. And so the income statement discusses or displays the company's results over a period of time. So this is the revenue, which is kind of the first item of the income statement, which most people call top line sometimes because it's literally the top line and it's the revenue. So this is how much company product was sold. But how much cash a bank has does make a big difference. So this is just a uphill company at the end of the day. They have cash, but it's really easy to determine what cash is. But when we look at the bank stocks, this is gonna be a lot more complicated. Okay, how about accounts receivable? This is a big line for this company. This is basically money that is owed to the company for their products. In corporate America, most products are sold on credit. They're not really sold in a uh, cash upfront kind of way. So if you're Mylan or Viatris, this company, you'll sell a pallet of pills, right? Like trucks load of pills to your, to your distributor. Don't worry about the cash, pay us when you can, right? Because you know they're, they're gonna pay. If they don't pay, all right, well, you can get the, the pills back. So you do business that way. It doesn't work that way in retail or something like that. Banks don't really have accounts receivable. They have loans receivable. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, inventories are another part of what's called working capital. So inventories in this case are, for this company, around $3 billion. And inventories are just products that you haven't sold yet. And they could be work in progress or whip. They could be raw materials that you're stockpiled, um, like chemicals in the case of making a pill, or you know possibly chip, you know chip equipment, not chip equipment, but let's say I don't know, chip parts um, before you make the final chip. That's called a work in progress. Or it could be a good that you're finished and you just haven't sold yet. That's fully packaged and fully ready to go. So banks also don't have this because banks don't aren't product companies. They kind of provide a service. So we're not going to see inventory or accounts receivable when we look at a bank balance sheet. We're really going to look at the, the financial assets the bank has and, and try to scrutinize those really carefully. And the point I'm making here is banks' balance sheets are 10 times harder to analyze than a tech company or a pharmaceutical company. Uh, they're actually really, really difficult because 
you have to comb through all of the fine print to see, well, what exactly are the bank's investments? Remember, the bank receives a liability. Their deposits are actually a liability because they end up taking all this cash in, but it's not their money, right? They're just holding it on. It's a deposit. So when they return the money, you know, there's, there's going to be a, uh, a liability that that money is owed to the customer. So in the meantime, they get to invest the money. And that's kind of the problem with banks, if you think about it, right? Like, they're very asymmetric. Um, when you put your money in a bank, the, the bank's using it to make money for themselves. Uh, you don't get that money, right? They want to pay you the lo lowest possible rate to get your money in. And these bigger banks, they know you kind of have to bank with them. So they arguably don't have to pay you anything, right? JP Morgan pays nothing on their bank balances. Good luck, right? So it's very, very difficult to, to have to um, work with these banks, right? Like, um, it, it's really frustrating uh, when there's, there's just not that many banks to choose from, and they're not that interested in competing with you. Um, uh, competing for, for your business, I should say, not with you, for you. Um, they just don't care. And, you know, in fact, they've gotten to a point where they can kick you out for, for not, you know, complying with what they you know, feel you should be complying with. When you buy a company and you buy, buy it for more than book value, you use that part that was more than book value and you have to put it on your balance sheet and you depreciate or amortize that over time. And what's funny about that goodwill though is it's worth nothing. It is literally worth nothing. Uh, but there's this concept that you didn't buy this company for more than its, than its uh, book value for no reason. So you must have bought it for some reason. And you could call that an intangible asset or goodwill. But... It's, um, you know, you have to sort of do an accounting class, and I've done a bunch of these on, on YouTube if you'd like to really get behind what is goodwill or what is intangibles. But that is basically zero. And sometimes we have this thing called tangible book, and I really want you to think about that for a second because there's book value, which is assets minus liabilities, uh, and then there's tangible book, which is your tangible assets minus liabilities. I like to look at tangible book because at the end of the day, those, those goodwill don't mean anything to me. Right? I can understand what cash is. I understand what accounts receivable is. Accounts receivable is a real asset. You know, those customers are going to pay me um, or I'll sue them and get the money. In 90, you actually can only put on accounts receivable the money that you're likely to get. So if somebody's delinquent, it doesn't go in here. It gets charged off. So this is $4 billion the company is likely to collect in the next like 30 to 90 days. So this is to me is almost as good as cash. This inventories are soon to become accounts receivable which will soon become cash. And sometimes that's called the CCC, cash conversion cycle. Um, and prepaids are assets too, right? Just because I paid for my salesforce.com or I paid for my Windows software doesn't mean it's not an asset. Until I use it, it's, it's sort of an asset of mine if you think about it that way. Like when you pay your rent, if you're prepaying your rent six months in advance, that's an asset of yours. That number will drop over time, but it's still an asset. This though, Goodwill, is worth zero. So as I sum up all the assets of this company, what do you notice? It's got 46 billion in assets. Well, that sounds like a big company, right? Wrong. You know, if you deleted this 33 billion, it's only 13 billion in assets. Let me put in the, the other things, like they have this deferred tax advantage because they're a foreign company and they have other assets, which are 2 billion. So our numbers in Excel match the numbers in this SEC filing. The SEC filing says the company has 50 billion in assets. So basically the real tangible assets are 17 billion. These are assets you can literally put your hands around and say, okay, this is real. So accounts payable is the opposite of accounts receivable. This is money you, you owe your vendors and you just haven't paid them yet. Um, debt is obvious and debt is gonna come really important when it comes to bank stocks. This company has a ton of debt because they paid a lot of money to Pfizer to merge Mylan with Pfizer's, one of Pfizer's divisions called Upjohn. So they have a ton of debt. And sometimes at this point, I like to put a line up here, which is not part of the balance sheet, but I like to do it myself just to look at it and say net cash. So their net cash is kind of what I think of as their net liquidity. So they have cash of a billion in the bank, but they have 18 billion they owe uh, bondholders. So they have negative net cash of 17 billion, which is quite a lot. And we're going to see how to interpret that in a second. So they have taxes they owe various tax authorities. That's around 300 million here. Um, they have more debt that I didn't count. Another 2 billion, or 1.2 billion, I should say. So that brings it up to 19 billion. They have, um, let's see, a couple more things here. Other current liabilities, which is kind of like a generic line of just other things, other money they owe, 
well, they're non-current liabilities. Non-current means that they owe it, the, the amounts are owed over more than one year. So current means, in balance sheet talk, current means within one year, non-current means with one year or more. So this is where things get really interesting. They have another tax line here. Okay, so all the liabilities add up to, um, let's see, it looks like 29 billion. Let's see if my Microsoft Excel has the exact number. Yes, 28,950, and this says 28,950, so I'm satisfied I put the numbers in correctly. But here's the problem. If I added all these liabilities up, let's just do it over here, I would think that this company is solvent, right? Because they have 50 billion in assets and 29 billion in liabilities. But wait a second, we already discussed that that goodwill is not real. It's just an accounting thing. So they really have 17 billion in assets and negative 29 billion, or I'm sorry, 29 billion in liabilities. So their tangible, their book value is, let's put this number back in actually. book value and tangible book value are very different things. So the book value of a company is assets minus liabilities, 21 billion. But the tangible book value is negative 11 billion. There's a really old joke in value investing circles which says what's the definition of book value? And obviously the book definition is assets minus liabilities. But the joke definition is it's the most amount of money you should pay for a stock. And the, the point of the joke is that the book value is literally should be the bottom amount of value of a company. The book value is sometimes called the liquidation value, right? If you bought a company, the balance sheet becomes yours. Think about this as like a quickie mart or something like that. Well, you get all the cash in the quickie mart's bank account. You get all the money that the quickie mart's customers owe it. You get all the inventories on the shelves, you get all the prepaid assets, you get all the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. It applies to any business, whether it's a Quickie Mart or Viatris or a bank or anything like that. Um, but you also owe all the bills, right? You owe all the debt, you owe all the taxes. So when you break down what's the, what's the net net, what's the book value, it looks positive if you don't include the goodwill, if you include the goodwill, but if you take out the goodwill, which is not valuable, it's negative. So if you bought all the shares of this company and shut it down today, you would owe $12 billion. But the company has a value. The company is worth $12 billion. Why is the company worth $12 billion? Well, because the company makes money every quarter. And, and that's sort of the way you look at it. So as we look at the, sh the shareholder's liability, which is what makes the balance sheet balance, it's assets minus liabilities. So this is syn a synonym for book value, the shareholder's equity. And we, we add this up to make sure that it equals assets. And you can see the balance sheet balances because those two are the same number. So if there's any questions, I can kind of um, explain it a little bit more. Um, but I hope that is useful in terms of the way a balance sheet works.